Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you to Kevin Finnerty for inviting me here to speak at the uh, Percy French Festival. I have to say that I was more or less reared on the music of Percy French. My father had a lovely baritone. It's not so great now that he's 92, although he would still have a crack at the woods of Gortnamona, which I used to make him sing for me and have a good cry. And then he'd have to cheer me up with uh, MacBreen's two daughters, of whom each one in turn was offered in marriage to James E. O'Byrne, and he took the one who came with the heifer, as far as I remember <laughs> being a good Ross Common man. Anyway, um, I say I'm delighted to be here, um, and the topic I'm speaking on is the truth and the law. Um, I'm a barrister, as Kevin said, as well as being a journalist. Before that, um, for a lot of years, I was a court reporter, so I've seen the courts and the law, I suppose, from both sides, both as a practitioner and as an observer, and as a colum columnist and commentator as well. So I'll start by, by throwing out there a very simple statement, which appears on the face of it to be the truth. A man is not a woman. You think I don't need to explain that, much less to defend it. And even a decade ago, you'd have questioned why I needed to state it at all. You'd certainly have been astonished 10 years ago if I told you that not only will a lot of people disagree with that statement, some people would seek to have me prosecuted for saying it at all. So what seems like an incontrovertible truth to me seems to be set in stone, absolutely undeniable, verifiable by the sight of my eyes, is to somebody else the most profound offensive lie. So if we can't agree on what is the truth, can we at least concur on the meaning of the word? And I have to say the philosophers are not a great help. Avicenna's definition of truth was what corresponds in the mind to what is outside of it. In other words, that if I think that a person who looks like a man, you know, is biologically male, is actually a male, then that is the truth. Now, he would be in a lot of trouble on Twitter these days, I can tell you. Aristotle said that to say what is, is, and what is not, is not, is true. Again, there would be carnage on his timeline if he tra tackled the transgender issue with that defence. That's called, that particular theory is called the correspondence theory of truth. The problem is that what we agree to be true and what we perceive with our intellects are not the same. So truth is often what we agree it to be, and we all adhere to that particular description and construct. For instance, you can go a few kilometres up the road and stand in a field. It'll look like an ordinary field, except it has been agreed that the northern end of the field is in a nation called the United Kingdom, which does not belong to the European Union, which has very different rules on trade, on agriculture, on revenue, on COVID and so on. And beyond an entirely invisible line, nothing to perceive with your eyes, nothing to detect with your intellect, you're in a country called the Republic of Ireland which is a member of the European Union, has very different rules. Those are truths. We agree those are truths, not because they're independently verifiable, not independently obvious realities, but because we, we agree them. We agree them to be true, for now, anyway. Um, the problems arise when we don't agree on what is the truth. Now, coming back to my original point, a man is not a woman, I have to say I am completely convinced, completely convinced, that some people have been born in the wrong body, totally. Um, and that I think it's miraculous that science and medicine and civilization have evolved to the point where that huge injustice can be, can be redressed. Cruel trick of fate really is what is of nature. I'd say I was probably the first person in, in this part of the world to interview a genuine transgender woman back in 1991, 30 years ago. That interview was published over two weeks in the Sunday Press, which I worked for at the time. Um, very, very courageous had been a man, had transitioned with all the surgery, married with two kids, I very c courageously agreed to tell me absolutely everything, and they ran it over two weeks in the Sunday Press. And I have to say, without a shadow of a doubt, having approached that person with a fearful that I might, be a, might betray some scepticism, I was completely convinced that this was female energy, that this was a woman. I completely convinced that who had been born in the wrong physical form. But I do not believe that a man who puts on a dress and a lipstick is a woman. Because being a human of that particular persuasion, I believe that my gender is informed by much more than my biological form, let alone my clothes or my makeup. It's shaped by my experiences, which are unique to women. And, and putting on a pair of false boobs does not necessarily give you access to that life experience. 
But as I say, I run the risk of being cancelled. You know what that means. It's the modern day equivalent of Chairman Mao's struggle sessions. The struggle sessions were, were, were these horrible um, sessions, basically, where if you were accused of, group of, of wrong think, if you didn't concur with the, with the, you know, the overriding dogma, then you were taken to a public place and a, a kind of a blackboard was put around your neck and your, your wrong statement or your wrong belief was written on the blackboard and then people gathered to shout abuse at you. People, you, maybe your colleagues, maybe your workmates, if you were better known, it might be in a football stadium and you'd have a big turnout. Uh, t Twitter, basically, uh, in, in, in Chairman Mao's time. Um, and the people got on the wrong side of, 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 wanted to be on the right side of the mob. So even if they kind of agreed with you, they went along and they shouted and they hurled abuse and they came away with their own credentials vindicated. So I, I basically, I run the risk of losing my career and my income. I'm, I'm a single parent with five kids. If those accusations against me for saying something like, a man is not a woman, become too loud for my employers to withstand, I run the risk of being prosecuted. I run the risk of potentially ending up with a criminal conviction for hate speech, for saying that a man is not a woman. So what is that real possibility? I'm not exaggerating. If people have lost their jobs for making that very statement, what does that say then about the relationship of the law and the truth? Well, there's another theory about the nature of truth, aside from the correspondence theory. Sorry to be hitting you with all these theories, but I did my research. Um, it's called the coherence theory, that something is more likely to be true if it fits comfortably into a large, coherent, and kind of generally acceptable system of beliefs, like, for example, there is an invisible line through a field in Derry that is dividing not just a farm, this particular farm that the border runs through, but two nations. Then there's the pragmatic theory of truth, which holds that truth leads to a successful action. And so if, if the action is successful, that is therefore proof that it was true. Well, now, as a barrister who does a bit of personal injuries work, and before that, as I said, as a court reporter, I have seen plenty of successful actions where a clearly dishonest, lying plaintiff got a big bundle of money, or where a guilty party was, a clearly guilty party was acquitted of a crime, where truth was a spectator, wasn't even, wasn't even a player. So what, where is the truth then when the law gets it wrong? In criminal cases in particular, I have to say, the jury sometimes find out pretty quickly if they have got it wrong. As I say, as a journalist or a lawyer, you know, you know, because you're an observer and you have access to, to court papers that the jury don't have, you know that the accused, for instance, had a string of previous convictions for the very same offence. The jury won't. They cannot be told that truth, that fact, because it might affect their determination of a different truth in a different set of circumstances, that being his guilt or his innocence. And so a good lawyer will come along and convince them black is white that there was definitely a reasonable doubt, and that's all they need to establish, as to the truth or as to the, of the accusation against the person. And reasonable doubt, just as an aside, it's, it's a difficult thing to define. I remember one judge, Frank Martin, used to be trying to explain it to, to juries, and he would say, OK, I'll tell you, I, it's easier to tell you what's not a reasonable doubt. He said, you, could, you might ring home and say, listen, don't bother cooking dinner for me <clears throat> this evening because I might be killed in a car accident on the way home. Wait and see what happens. Um, he said, of course, that's a possibility. Is it possible that things will happen that way? But is it really reasonable? Um, I don't know if it helped the jurors. Probably made them wary of ringing home, actually. But anyway. Um, but then when the trial ends and the jury have come to their verdict and they have sweated blood and they have argued and they've spent three days uh, sequestered away in their jury room and they've decided there is a reasonable doubt and they're going to let this go free, this guy go free. And the judge thanks them for their efforts, tell them they're absolved from jury duty for the next 20 years. And then he turns to the prosecution, or she turns to the prosecution barrister and says, now I believe there's another matter I have to deal with. And then the prosecution counsel stands up and says, yes, um, the newly acquitted man who's just been judged not to have a stain on his character, actually has a string of convictions to which he has all, uh, prior convictions. He's also pleaded guilty to a number of related crimes, very similar to the one he's just been acquitted of. And then he's about to be sentenced for that. And I, I would say, looking at the jury's faces then, you know in those, those game shows where you have to pick a, the right box? And they know they picked the wrong box. They picked the wrong box. Their concept of the truth has changed. One minute ago in their view, this was true, this man was innocent. Now they've, they've had that challenged. So their verdict was not wrong. 
it was based on the evidence before them, but was it the true verdict, the, the, the juror's oath calls on them to give a true verdict, true verdict give according to the evidence. Was that what they gave? If the truth was that 12 citizens believed that person was not guilty, did that, ma did that make that person's innocence a truth or a fact? Just to come on to a case that you're probably all familiar with, it's a lot, uh, getting a lot of coverage at the moment, the 25-year-old unsolved murder of Sophie de Plantier. Now, the French say that in that case, they have established the truth, that a man called Ian Bailey killed her. They've convicted him in his absence. Now, that trial had no forensic evidence, no fingerprints, no bloodstains, no witnesses. They, they rejected a, a statement that didn't accord with an original statement that they said they preferred because it all pointed more towards his... Guilty. By our standards, a trial like that, we would say, would put North Korea to shame. They wanted someone to blame, not somebody to convict. They operate under the Napoleonic Code, which is interrogatory rather than adversarial. In that case, I would suggest they put the dogs in the street in the jury box, and they got the verdict they wanted. Um, but Nietzsche said the falseness of a judgment is not necessarily an objection to that judgment. The question is to what extent it is life-enhancing, life-preserving, species-preserving, perhaps even species-breeding. Now, a lot of people in this country believe that our system should have prosecuted Bailey and presumably should have convicted him, even though the evidence wasn't there, in the interests of the greater good. So if a false judgment serves the greater good in the short term, does that make it right, and therefore, does that make it true? Which kind of brings me on then to my central subject. What is the relationship between the law and the truth? Does the law purport to establish the truth and proceed to administer justice based on that determination? Or does it strive to seek justice between the parties, justice for the accused, justice for the victims, and hope that the truth is somehow, therefore, vindicated in the process? In other words, if a result is just and it is fair, does that also make it true? Of course not. I was in a court last week, in, in a court list which is not held in camera, in private, it's open to the public, when a very difficult family law matter kind of emerged in, in the process of, of, of the, the application being made. Um, it was a bank's application for a summary judgment against an estranged, separated couple. And I have to say the judge, to her credit, a female judge, got very cross with the bank and the way they were dealing with this unfortunate people. They were basically stuck living under the same roof. They couldn't afford a mortgage, and a second mortgage, they couldn't afford the first mortgage, and they couldn't afford rent. And she adjourned the case for as long as she possibly could, with some harsh words for the barrister for the uh, bank, um, to give them time to get their affairs in order. Now, that was right, and that was just, and that was fair, and everybody else except him in the court thought that was the right thing to do. But the truth remains that that couple borrowed that money. The truth is they owe that money, and the truth is they have to pay it back. So it might be just and decent for the law to say you would clear off vultures, leave them alone, but it is not a true verdict on the situation. Now, I have to say, and you'll say I'm saying this because I am practising as a barrister, but most judges, I believe, do their best to make the truth the bedrock of their adjudications. Some don't, and, and hopefully those, those, those appointments are being weeded out, but most of them do. In fact, I'd say the majority do. But how do you know when somebody is lying? How can a judge or a counsel um, or, or a, a juror tell if somebody is lying? Because lying, I mean, whatever about the truth, I would say lying is a very subjective and very fluid concept. So just to give you an example, it emerged recently that 90% of litigants who had suffered soft tissue injury and had been undergoing physiotherapy for their soft tissue injury up until their court case came on, no longer needed physio after they got their compensation. <laughs> now, if you were going to apply Aristotle's correspondence theory, you would have to conclude this obvious truth. The best cure for a stiff neck is the application of a big wadge of money to the patient's bank account. What is, is. What is not, is not. And I, I have to say, you'd have to take a very depressing view of human nature to believe that every one of those people was actively lying, actively perjuring themselves. I, I, I'm prepared to, to give human nature this much credit as to say that the explanation is that they believed at the time that this was true, that they had a sore neck, that it was somebody else's fault, that they needed physiotherapy and they deserved the money. And other people got the money, the same money, bigger money, why shouldn't they have it? Um, I think most of these people, if you ask them, 
and sincerely would consider themselves to be honest people. They'd, they'd bring back extra change if they got in a shop. They'd, they wouldn't park in a disabled space. They'd, they'd, they have television licences. But they somehow managed to construct a truth to suit their purposes and do it with a clear conscience and do it, in lots of cases, with a sense of entitlement. Um, I had a case, I was in a case recently, a personal injury case, where there was a direct, fundamental, absolutely black and white conflict of evidence between the two sides. Both versions could not be true. I, I won't go into detail because the case was in the paper, but a young man sustained life-altering injuries. Now, both versions of what was told to the judge were absolutely credible and coherent, but they couldn't possibly both be true. Uh, the, the accident had happened about three years ago. So both, obviously, both sides were testifying based on their memory of what happened on the day, right? Wrong, they weren't. We know from memory, actually, the way memory works, they weren't. That's not the way memory works. When you remember something, you don't remember the original event. You remember the last time you remembered it. You're remembering your own memory of it, your own retelling of it, not the original event. So before the case started, both sides were in negotiation or in, in consultation with their witnesses. And I, we were inside, outside the, the, for, the uh, forecourt, the law library, and, and, and the plaintiff, I could see him outside in, in the judge's yard, it's called Car Park, with um, his counsel. And he was kind of physically acting out what happened. He was, he was describing what had happened from his memory. And when he got into the witness box, that was the version he gave. It was based on his memory, but it was based on his memory of the account he'd given his senior counsel that morning. So in that respect, it was entirely true. The fact is the judge didn't believe him, but he hadn't, he hadn't lied. He had told, based on his memory, which had evolved to suit his purposes over the three years, he was telling the truth. The judge didn't believe him. Um, she reached what was a very difficult, very tough, very courageous decision, but she weighed up the facts using her common sense and her intellect to reach a truth, if you want to call it that, that she could defend. So you might say, well, was it just and fair that a young man who had suffered a life-altering, irreparable injury, changed everything about his life going forward, and through no real fault of his own, got nothing. He got nothing. He walked away with a whopping legal bill. Um, some people would say no. Um, is it fair and just that the families of severely disabled children have to prove that somebody in the HSE was negligent during their birth before they can get compensation to support them? Arguably not. But that is the system that we have, and it is fundamentally based on determining accountability. Trying to get the truth of what happened, yes, but hoping that the truth and justice will dovetail. Now, by and large, you probably think I would say this, but I think it works, you know, albeit at a snail's pace and at an unconsciously, unconscionably ruinous expense to ordinary people. But the point is nobody, not the judge, not, not the lawyer, not the, the, the juror, who wasn't an actual eyewitness to an event like the one I've just described knows the truth. The best any of us can hope to do, and the judge can hope to do, and even, you know, if you're talking to your client, th th what you can hope to do is decide which version, all things being equal, is more likely to be true, what accords more closely with what we know to be true based on your own common sense, your intellect, your life experience, when applied to the, the chosen, to the proven facts of the, of the individual case. It's not perfect, but then I'm going to quote you an English jurist called Frederick Pollock, who said in 1922, a trial is not a search for the truth, it is to establish a fact, a, sorry, it is to establish a basis of fact for the adjustment of a dispute between litigants. Now, sometimes, for example, the rules of evidence force a, dis a huge divergence, and you would say an unjust divergence, between the substantive truth, the, the obvious truth, and the formal legal truth. For example, the guards are hunting a serial killer, and they go into his house and they find a blood-stained axe under his bed, fingerprints on it, hair stuck to it, but it was obtained during an illegal search. That is not admissible. The jury will never hear the truth of that. Or a confession is extracted with um, duress, from a, 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 an accused person. It may be entirely truthful. It may be he might have finally decided to, 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 to cough up, but its, it's, it's exclusion is justified. Its exclusion from the evidence is justified on the basis of public policy. You can't be beaten. 
confessions out of people, even if they're the truth. Um, again, here's uh, Mr. Pollock again. The greatest of all fallacies entertained by lay people about the law is that it is the business of a court of justice to discover the truth. Its real business is to pronounce upon the justice of particular claims and incidentally, and only incidentally, to test the truth of the assertions of fact made in support of the claim in law, providing that those assertions are relevant in law to the establishment of the desired conclusion. And that is by no means the same thing. So the desired conclusion, which is the administration of justice and the truth, are not necessarily the same thing. Um, in, in most cases, though, I think there is a truth as well as a desired conclusion. You know, whether or not you get to it, whether or not the hearing unearths it, whether a clever lawyer is able to obscure it, whether flawed memories on the part of, of, of the witnesses have misplaced it, and also whether or not a jury wants to hear it, because we've seen cases where juries have willfully gone against the evidence, especially in, in libel cases. There's a bone of contention for the media, as you probably know. But there's usually a, a kernel of solid, definable actuality at the heart of any issue, except in one, in one area of law, which I say does not belong in the court at all. It's not even a, a, a suitable subject for law, and that's family law. And I feel really strongly about this because I know so many people who have had the most miserable experiences, the most ruinous, heartbreaking, agonising experiences in the family courts. I, I believe myself that it is inexpressibly cruel to process marital and child custody matters, for example, through the court. You know, in most of these cases, there's, there's no objective truth, if that's what we're talking about. You have just two miserable, unhappy, possibly bitter people with their conflicting recollections of their own intimate history. You know, and, and even you know, the desired conclusion of Mr. Pollock is really difficult to, to achieve. Justice is difficult to achieve between two people in those circumstances. You know, of course people lie, and you do apply the same rules. Um, to, to, to you know, the taking of evidence as you do in, 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 in other cases like commercial or chancery or contract or whatever. And people do lie. They lie in family law. They lie everywhere else. They lie on their affidavit. It means they hide money. They lie about their fidelity. I never spoke to that woman in my life. They, they lie about the other party's parenting skills. They use their children as battering rams, no question. But uh, in my view, th that still doesn't make it an area of law that should be heard by a judge sitting at a remove from two miserable people on opposite sides of the courtroom, are lawyered up to the teeth at 500 euro an hour or whatever it costs in the High Court. And the difference is, there's a difference that makes it distinct from every other area of law as far as I can see, and from every other legal relationship between, as, as you'd be known in family law, the applicant and the respondent or the plaintiff and the defendant. And the, the reality is these two people loved each other at one stage. You know, they, they went into this legal contract with the best of intentions, with every, every desire to make it succeed. It's not like contract law, even though it's comparable to contract law, where one party might have been holding something back, one party might have been hoping for an advantage. That's not generally not the case when people get married. And something, and it might have been somebody's fault, it might have been nobody's fault, it might have been fault on both sides something went wrong. Like, that's not usually the case in other areas of law. Usually somebody is to blame or somebody did the wrong thing or somebody breached a term of the agreement. And I would say that if we had a humane system to deal with family law, it would try to mediate that breach. It would oblige couples to engage in mediation for maybe five or six sessions. At the moment, all the law is obliged to do, all your solicitor is obliged to do, is say, have you thought about mediation? If you say, no, I want to bring the batter to court, then they'll say, fine. You know, and then they'll switch on the meter. Um, I, I'd say it, not only would that, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I was going to say was then if, if you obliged, if you oblige couples to go to, to maybe five or six sessions of mediation and say to the mediator, look, if one of these people is clearly not playing ball, you'll have to record that, you'll have to make a note of that, and then only let the matter go to court where all else has failed with extreme prejudice towards the one who scuppered. 
the, 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 the negotiations? Because that seems to me to be sane. That's not what happens at the moment. You know we have uh, the Personal Injuries uh, um, Assessment Board for personal injuries. Every personal injury has to go through that. And you know, you'll be offered a sum of money and you only go to court if you don't want to take it. I don't understand why we don't have an arrangement like that for family law, that people have to go through a, a sort of a weeding out process or a, a, a kind of, um, what would you say, a resolution process that keeps them out of the court. I mean, litigants in, 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 in personal injuries, you know, there's insurance companies involved. It, it, there's, no, there's not the same level of angst and passion as you get in, in family law, and there's no, no defence other than the vast sums of money it generates for keeping it before the courts. Um, and, and, you know, if, only, if, if the only thing you send be put before the courts in family law is, is the financial divvy up, that's fine, but cheaper things like children's access to their parents should not be decided by a judge. Because I can tell you, no matter how bitter and how angry and how upset people are, the couples are, before they embark on marital proceedings, they will be 100 times more bit bitter, more angry, more divided afterwards, at great cost to themselves, to their children, and to their finances. And I have to say, the system, as it, as it stands, encourages that. It positively encourages people to use the law to vent their anger. And a lot of people make a lot of money. Not me, I don't do family law, but a lot of people make a lot of money in the process. And um, there was a case, I don't know if anybody read about it, before the Court of Appeal last week, where a husband was appealing against, I think it was a refusal of uh, a judicial review of a uh, costs order that was made against him in a family case against his wife. And the court heard that this, this family matter, this, this divorce, whatever they were looking for, had been going on for 17 years. And that this couple, this man, had dragged his wife before the court for 140 days. Now, 140 days, just to break that down, that is 28 sitting weeks. That's more than half a year, two legal terms, one judge doing nothing but this one family case for no other reason them to let this man beat his wife around a courtroom. No other reason than to settle scores. Now, the, the Court of Appeal, uh, when it came before them two weeks ago, finally called a halt. And they said that this man had, been, had weaponized family law and had used it as a blunt instrument to oppress his wife. But I would say that, you know, the reality is when you apply an adversarial system to something like family law, which is more appropriate to deal with, say, with commercial, with contract, with criminal law, to an area of human interaction that is governed by, by passion, by lust, by jealousy, by obsession, and none of which, by the way, are great contributors to rational thought or discussion, um, you have already fashioned that blunt instrument. You have polished it and you have handed it to the strongest party, usually the one with the most money or the most rage. Um, just recently, you probably heard the Chief Justice has been calling for 20 new judges because there's, expect, there's, there's already 40 judges, so this would increased by 50%, the complement of High Court judges, um, to deal with what is expected to be a huge backlog across all areas of law, because the courts were largely closed down for the last year and, and operating remotely. Um, so they're expecting a monumental backlog in areas like judicial review, in contracts, and also, of course, in family, because we saw calls to, to the Women's Aid helpline went up exponentially in the course of the, of the pandemic. So there'll be a lot more couples being processed through family law um, post-pandemic. A lot more misery to be thrashed out in the courts. And um, here's my mad proposal, which will never get outside this room, I would say, but if you took family law out of the courts, even to the extent that I'm suggesting, even to the extent of insisting that everybody who is processing a separation or a divorce first of all, sits down across a room, not across a courtroom, across a room with a mediator and the other side, and they try their best to resolve it, you would free up dozens of judges on a daily basis. You'd have certainly freed up 140 court days, by the way, the cost of which would have been three million between that couple, easily. You would have freed up 28 sitting weeks, to say two legal terms, in that one case. Now, that's, that's not to say that the alternative process of mediation would necessarily deliver justice, but it wouldn't get hung up on the truth, on justice. It would be far more likely to achieve what I would say, at the end of the day, ought to be the objective of any legal process when you think about it. Not necessarily justice, actually. Not even necessarily the truth, but peace, peace between the parties.